weeks of the uh, Characters of the Resurrection. As you probably saw in the preview, we're going to be talking tonight about Mary, our Blessed Mother, the Virgin Mary, um, and kind of her role in the resurrection from kind of Easter Sunday onwards, and what it is that we can learn from her. And this is the month of May, right? So this is a time where we can be growing in our relationship with Mary and our devotion to Mary. So I hope this uh, talk is enriching for your faith, um, helps you to connect more with Mary, because we can never get enough of Mary, because she always leads us closer and closer to her son, Jesus. So again, welcome everybody as we prepare to jump into this talk on Mary. So uh, there's no more fitting way to begin than in prayer, asking for our Blessed Mother to be with us today. We commend this evening, we commend this time of prayer and of learning uh, into the hands of our Blessed Mother as we pray in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So Mary's wrapping us in prayer. Mary is literally, she's literally here, but she's also all around us. We've got an icon here of Mary. We've got um, an image here of Our Lady of Guadalupe. We've got the Pieta here, this, this famous scene uh, sculpted by Michelangelo. And we've got a couple other images coming your way, so stay tuned for that. So today we're going to be talking about uh, Mary and her story as it develops from kind of this uh, resurrection period. What is it that we can learn about her? What is it that she can uh, teach us and how she can connect with us a little bit more closely as our Blessed Mother? How can we grow in that relationship given the, the, um, the unique journey that she had after the resurrection? So here's a little pop quiz for you. In which gospel do we read about Jesus appearing to his mother, Mary? Ah, it's a trick question, right? Because there's actually no record in the Gospels of Jesus appearing to his mother Mary. He appears to Mary Magdalene. We read the accounts of him appearing to his apostles. There's lots of people he, um, it's recorded that he appeared to. And yet we don't have a written account of uh, what happened if he met his blessed mother on Easter Sunday. So it's just but been kind of part of our tradition to say that it would be very fitting to say, that Jesus, uh, of course, met up with his blessed mother after he was uh, risen from the dead and was most likely the one that he went to first. Because, I, I mean, I'm just thinking it, for my own life, like if I were to die and rise from the dead and I was around for 40 days before I ascended into heaven and I talked with a bunch of people, all my friends, these other people, and I didn't talk to my mom, like she would put me back in the grave, right? You, you don't do that. You go to your mama first. And so it would be very fitting for Jesus to appear to Mary first, even though we don't have that explicitly recorded in Scripture. It just seems fitting. Um, and I wanted to share two saints who kind of expressed this view that, yeah, we can, we can reasonably um, infer that Jesus would have appeared to our blessed, or, uh, yeah, to our blessed mother, to his mother, first. Uh, so we have a, a text from St. Ignatius of Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits, and he encourages retreat, retreatants to pray with this image of what it would have been like for Jesus on Easter Sunday morning to, uh, to be reunited with his mother that Easter Sunday morning. And the reason why he kind of backs up this possibility, the, the argument that he poses, is by referring to this verse from John's Gospel, where John writes, There are also many other things that Jesus did, but if these were to be described individually, I do not think the whole world could contain the books that would be written. So in other words, Jesus did a lot of things. Not all of them are written down in the written tradition of Scripture. There's also oral tradition. Uh, that's, that's part of the great uh, reason why we're Catholics. We believe in Scripture, but we believe that there's also this oral tradition. And together, the two of them point us to uh, what it is that God has revealed to us in His Son, Jesus. So St. Ignatius is saying, because of that one verse that says that there's so many other things that happen, we can reasonably infer that even though it wasn't explicitly written, Jesus met his mother on Easter Sunday. We also have um, Pope John Paul II weighing in on this matter. 
he was giving a general audience in 1997. So this isn't like a, a magisterial statement. This isn't an infallible statement. This is just him speaking to a crowd about um, his own belief on the matter. This is what he had to say to the crowd. He said, The Gospels mention various appearances of the risen Christ, but not a meeting between Jesus and his mother. This silence must not lead to the conclusion that after the resurrection, Christ did not appear to Mary. Indeed, it is legitimate to think that the mother was probably the first person to whom the risen Jesus appeared. Present at Calvary on Good Friday and in the upper room on Pentecost, the Blessed Virgin, too, was probably a privileged witness of Christ's resurrection, completing in this way her participation in all the essential moments of the Paschal mystery. So again, he's very careful to say that we don't believe that this for sure happened, but it just seems most fitting. It seems most probable. So I think that's actually something that's kind of beautiful for us. It's kind of left up to our imagination. If we're going to kind of jump on this bandwagon that says, yeah, he would most likely appear to Mary first on Easter Sunday, I think that's a great exercise for our imaginations in prayer to imagine what that would have been like. I think this could be an especially helpful exercise for uh, you mothers out there who are having a difficult time right now, maybe particularly because of the social distancing. Your Mother's Day looked a little different than normal. There's kind of a separation between you and your children. Um, I think, for instance, also of uh, mothers from our parish who have uh, children who are serving overseas in the armed forces, um, as, as well as um, mothers in our parish who have had a child who has passed away and just the great pain of that separation of, uh, between the mother and her child. It's, it's, uh, it's unlike any other pain, I think, on, on this side of heaven. Um, so I think this image of Mary experiencing that separation of losing her son, and then the great joy of being reunited with him on Easter Sunday, I think could be a great consolation for all of you moms, especially, who are really longing to be reunited with your children under whatever circumstances that may, that may take. Um, and just to, just to see that just as Jesus fulfilled his promise of the resurrection uh, and was reunited with his mother, so too uh, Jesus offers us that same hope that we too can hope to be reunited with our loved ones who, whom we may be separated from right now. So that's a little bit about uh, what, just to kind of get us thinking about this idea of Mary on Easter Sunday. And now I'm actually going to be doing a little tag team with Father Jose. There's a beautiful tradition um, in the Peruvian culture that centers around this idea of Jesus and Mary meeting each other on Easter Sunday. And when he told me about this, I, I just thought it was really beautiful. So I'm going to actually have him come in for a couple minutes and briefly, briefly, talk about um, just this, this very beautiful tradition and just kind of what it means to him. So, Padre, take it away. Not a problem. Briefly. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everybody. This is Father Jose. Uh, very happy to share a little bit of my own culture, Peru. Well, you know, I am from Peru. Uh, Peru is in South America. And Peru was conquered by the Spaniards in 1532. And so that means that after that particular uh, time in history, we didn't know Christianity uh, and any elements of Christianity at all. And so with the conquest of uh, from, from the old world, from Spain into uh, our area of the world, South America, we, we uh, encounter evangelization for, for the very first time. And evangelization was rough because the same people that were bringing um, the cross, they were the ones that were bringing the sword. And so it was very hard for the first generation of Spaniards to try to find a way to evangelize the native Peruvians at the time. One thing that they learned, though, is that in, in the ancient culture of the Incas in Peru, it was very customary to do processions. So they used to, for example, mummify the bodies, the corpses of the Incas, and they will be put in a fetal position and, and wrapped. And then eventually those images were brought in procession on the streets. So, ah, the Spaniards did something very similar, but with the saints, with the images of the saints, images of Jesus, images of popular saints, images of our Blessed Mother. So processions, public processions actually became uh, the, the, the most important way 
that the Spaniards used for evangelization of the new continent. And so they started doing that by replacing those ancient traditions of the Incas for the new um, uh, traditions of the processions of the saints. Okay? Now the town where I am from is called Lambayeque, Peru. It's in the northern part of the coast of Peru. And in this particular town, we have a lot of processions, especially during the time of Holy Week into Easter Sunday. On Holy Week, actually on Good Friday, there is a large, large procession that is similar to the Stations of the Cross, but it's not exactly the Stations of the Cross that we know because the 14 Stations of the Cross that we know of were set after. So these are like the pre-Stations of the Cross, if you want to call it. So for example, here I have a picture of Jesus carrying the cross, and this is a church. Uh, where I grew up, I was an altar server in that church. It's huge, St. Peter Church in, in Lambayeque, Peru. This is the image of Jesus carrying the cross. We also have an image, um, if I can find it right away, yep, of Jesus crucified and also with the background church. You see the towers of the church in there and the image of Jesus right there uh, crucified, okay? So this all is part of the procession of, of, um, of Holy Week. But then on Easter Sunday, very early in the morning, there is a procession that um, starts from both ends of the church. So from one end of the church comes out the image of risen Jesus very early in the morning. It's at six in the morning in my hometown. And we're talking about processions that gather thousands of people. This is not just small group, uh, a little parish doing this. is This is a massive event. And so all the men process with Jesus, the risen Jesus, in one extreme of the, of, the, of the plaza. And on the other end of the church leaves the sorrowful mother in procession with all the women, and they go around the plaza. And finally, they meet, they meet with the risen Jesus with the sorrowful mother, Together they meet on the other side of the plaza. And this is the picture of their meeting. Okay, I want you to look at this. This is risen Jesus. You can see him right there. And so he has all kinds of arrangements so that they, they show that he is risen. He's in white, obviously, because he's risen. But the Blessed Mother, you see her here. I'm going to go a little closer. And you can see all the people. The Blessed Mother is wearing black. She has a white ba a black veil, and there is all kinds of incense going on. There are thousands of people. This happens every single Easter Sunday morning in my hometown. Okay? Now, what happened? There is a huge tradition in the town that is very similar to the May crowning. And that the, the May crowning that is so popular here in the United States is that they choose a girl in the town, and the girl goes up and she takes the black veil of Mary and then puts her normal blue uh, veil, which is the traditional color assigned to our Blessed Mother. So, this is the before. So, she's in black, and Jesus risen. That's the encounter. And this is the after. And, once again, the risen Jesus right there, victorious. And, also, you can see our Blessed Mother right here. She has a white veil now with a blue um, garment. And so she had been changed from being the sorrowful mother into now the, the rejoicing Blessed Mother at the knowledge that her song had risen from the dead. I'm going to show you another picture here, which is from a different perspective. So this is after the encounter. That's the risen Jesus again. You can see him right there with his flag and everything because he's victorious. And then our Blessed Mother now had been changed from black into blue with her white veil. And that's, that's the tradition in the, in the town. Like Kevin had mentioned, this encountering between uh, Mary and Jesus on the day of the resurrection does not appear in the Gospels. However, in the Christian traditions, it is only fitting to imagine that particular moment when uh, our Blessed Mother saw her song. Because... Normally, we are so accustomed of seeing her with her dead song. In the case, for example, at the cross, or in the case of the Pieta, 
with the with the corpse, the dead body of her son. Uh, but this tradition of the encounter between Jesus and Mary on the day of resurrection has been part of the Christian tradition all along. Uh, this procession is several hundred year, years old and has been happening uh, for, for all that time, except for this year. This year, uh, when we had the um, Easter, Easter Sunday celebration, my uh, sis, we, we had a, uh, like a live stream mass with my family, and it was kind of cool to have several people, several households in the screens in this uh, call, and we were able to celebrate the mass. And my sister that still lives in Lambayeque with my dad, they said that that was the thing that they really missed on that day, is that they woke up at 5.30 in the morning, because that's normally the time that they would wake up on Easter Sunday, because they had to run to the plaza to be part of the procession of the encounter. El Encuentro, we say in Spanish, between the risen Jesus and the Blessed Mother. But of course, that didn't happen this year due to the pandemic. So it's one of those things that, that uh, you treasure in your memory and is part of many memories of my childhood. So so I just wanted to share that. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful uh, liturgical, extra-biblical experience that Catholics around the world, uh, wor the world still celebrate the encounter of the risen Jesus with his mother on the day of the resurrection. And with that, I am going to give the microphone back to uh, seminarian Kevin. Are you back, Kevin? I am. All right. Bye-bye. Okay. Thanks, Father. Oh, it's beautiful. And maybe you probably have a video of that somewhere you could post in the comments after the talk or something. Yeah, that'd be really cool if, if you're able to see it. Um, it's a very meaningful custom. Okay, so that's a little bit about Mary on Easter Sunday. Now, continuing with this theme of Mary as a character of the resurrection, I want to look at the one other instance uh, that's mentioned in Scripture of Mary after the resurrection, and that's during this time between Ascension and Pentecost. So if you remember Easter Sunday, Jesus rises from the dead. He's around for about 40 days, speaking with various people. At the end of those 40 days, he ascends into heaven, and nine days later, on Pentecost, the Holy Spirit descends on the early church. So what happens in uh, the book of Acts, which is what we've been reading throughout uh, the Masses the last several weeks, uh, or I think through all the, through all the Easter season, um, at the start, Luke, kind of, Luke, the author of Acts, is kind of providing a little bit of context to kind of set the stage for the book of Acts, saying that you know, Jesus had risen from the dead, he had talked to these people, and uh, right before he ascended into heaven, he was doing some other things. And I want to I hone in on this verse. It's in chapter 1, verse 4. So pretty much right from the start, this, this verse has been speaking to me really all year. And in particular, in preparing for this talk, this verse was sticking out to me. So he writes in verse 4, While meeting with them, Jesus enjoined them, that is the apostles, not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, about which you have heard me speak. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So this is right before Jesus ascends into heaven. He tells his apostles, wait here in Jerusalem. Wait so that you can receive the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. And as I'm reading that, I had to kind of laugh to myself, because in the midst of what we're going through right now, I thought, this is the first ever stay-at-home order, right? Jesus is ordering them to stay home, stay in Jerusalem before you go out. I know you have this zeal. I know you have these different gifts to be able to spread the gospel, but you need to be equipped with the Holy Spirit before you go out. So you need to stay in Jerusalem for right now. So we're going we're gonna to unpack that scene in a little bit, but um, that's just a little bit of context to prepare us for uh, one of the further readings. So this happens. Jesus ascends to the Father. And then we have this verse, uh, or verses, verses 13 through 14, just a little while later. It says, When they entered the city, they went to the upper room where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas son of James. All these devoted themselves with one accord to prayer, together with some women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. So, 
Jesus ascends to the Father. Mary and his apostles are waiting in Jerusalem, so they're joining one another in prayer. They're united in prayer. And then, as we all know, what happens nine days later, Pentecost comes, the Holy Spirit descends on them, and they are equipped with this supernatural grace to be able to spread the gospel to the ends of the world. So what I want to focus on in this kind of second part of this talk tonight on Mary is this period of time of waiting between Easter, between, excuse me, the Ascension and Pentecost. Because I think we can learn from Mary during this period of time how it is that we can have this enduring disposition of an active, hope-filled waiting. That's what I think Mary can teach us in this stretch of time between Ascension and Pentecost. She teaches us how to wait actively with hope. So first I want to point out this word, wait, that we first talked about in Acts 1-4, when Jesus tells them, wait in Jerusalem for the Holy Spirit. I was kind of interested, I went online to look, what's, what's the Greek word here? I'm not a Greek scholar by any means, but sometimes when you see what the word was originally, when it was originally written, you can see what it was in Greek. It just sheds a whole new meaning on the word. So I went back and looked at, what is this word here that we have translated as wait in Jerusalem? And what I found was that this word wait denotes a kind of abiding or, um, or remaining in. Like remember that famous image that Jesus employs in his uh, Last Supper discourse when he says, I am the vine, you are the branches, abide in me, for without me you can do nothing. Just that, that very tangible image of abiding in me, like a vine and branches. That's, that's kind of the sense of the waiting that's being described here. So he's, he's not asking them to just kind of passively kick their feet up and, you know, just kind of twiddle their thumbs and just kind of wait for the nine days. There's a certain kind of activeness that he's expecting from them that's taking place in the waiting. Something's going to be happening as they're waiting. It's not just like the thing that they're waiting for is at the finish line, but there's something happening in the waiting as well. And I thought of a lot of different images to uh, illustrate this. And I mean, they're all over the place. You've seen this, no doubt, in, in nature, in you know pregnancies. Uh, so just bear with me as I kind of go through this list of images of how, as we wait, there are things that are happening underneath the surface that we don't always kind of see right away. So for instance, we're looking outside our windows right now, kind of getting into uh, the springtime starting to eventually make our way into summer. We're seeing all the flowers and the, the trees. They're, they're beginning to bloom, blossom, leaves are coming back. All of this is like we're watching day by day as it looks like more and more buds are kind of beginning to sprout. And maybe uh, some of you are, are farmers, maybe some people joining us from the thumb. Uh, so you know kind of the, the waiting that has to occur as the crops are growing and you're waiting to harvest them. Um, even thinking about like as we're waiting for the sun to reach its peak, we get to experience the beauty of that sunrise. And as we're waiting for night to fall, there's the beauty of the sunset. Um, going back to mothers, there's that silence uh, that happens in that nine-month waiting period of your pregnancy. And it's not like there's nothing happening in those nine months as you're waiting to welcome this child into the world. There's the, a formation that's happening. There's something very active that's happening in that waiting in a pregnant mother. I think also of moths, which spin their silk and they create a cocoon, and in the midst of that cocoon, they're able to be transformed, and they eventually emerge uh, stronger than ever, and they're, they're able to um, adapt to whatever it is that nature throws at them. But if, for instance, we were to go up to one of those cocoons and we see the moth in there, they're being transformed, and we were to kind of start to make a little slit in the side of the cocoon, and the thing emerges, it comes out of there, and it might flutter around for a little bit, but it's not yet strong enough to survive in the wilderness. It needs that time in the cocoon. It needs that waiting period in order to be strengthened to then be kind of sent forth into the world. And I think that's a similar image we could apply to the apostles here in the upper room. They needed to go through those nine days of waiting, of stretching, of being transformed 
on this human level, being devoted to prayer with our Blessed Mother, so that they were all the more ready to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. So here's a brief reflection question as we kind of pause, take a time out here to realize what it is that we've been talking about and be able to apply it to your own life and to your own prayer. Um, all of us right now are in a similar period or area of waiting right now, right? We're all waiting for churches to reopen. We're all waiting for um, different businesses to open. We're waiting for the stay-at-home order to be lifted. We're waiting for that end goal. But here's a question I would invite you to reflect on. In this time of waiting, what's been being formed in you? What's been kind of blossoming underneath the surface? What's been taking shape? Have you experienced in this period of waiting uh, new desires and resolutions being stirred within you? Have you noticed that these old wounds or these old tendencies that you thought you had control over, that you thought you had kind of pushed under the rug, have you noticed that those have begun to come to the surface in the midst of the waiting? Are you noticing that you're having a greater appreciation for the things that you had originally taken for granted? It can be very easy to look at this time of waiting as just kind of this useless time, fruitless time. And yet, even in this period of waiting, God is with us and he's bringing about transformation in our lives, um, even if we don't notice it. So I would invite you to consider in this time of waiting that we're all in, what have you noticed the Lord doing in you, revealing to you over the past uh, last month and a half or so as you've been in this waiting process? It's also interesting to know, I did a little bit more research on this word, wait, who would have thought I've been so fascinated by just this one simple word that we use all the time, wait. But I looked again at um, the fact that this Greek word that's translated wait, it's only used in this one instance. And I thought, there's got to be other times in the Gospels that use the word wait. And sure enough, there's plenty of times where that word is used. But there's a different Greek word that we have translated as wait. And what that word is, again, I'm not a Greek scholar. Maybe the three of you who are watching who are can correct me. But I think this word is apekdekamoi. Father Jose will probably correct me on that. Um, I'm taking Greek this fall, so forgive me. Um, and what this word kind of denotes, that's translated wait for us, what it means is it's kind of like this uh, active longing. It's a desire-filled waiting. It's like you can see your eyes on the prize, and it's right there, and you're just waiting for it. So the, the image immediately came to mind, um, if any of you are dog owners or if you've you know, seen videos of this online, you can just imagine like a dog who has a treat that's balanced on its nose and it just is ever so patiently keeping its eyes on the prize and it's just waiting for the master's command and it's going to devour that thing, right? You can just like tell in that gaze that there's a waiting that's desire filled, that's got its eyes on the prize. And there are a lot of instances in scripture where this sense of waiting is referred to. And there's also um, a couple instances in the liturgy that I wanted to point out. So for instance, uh, this is in St. Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 8. He says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are as nothing compared with the glory to be revealed to us. For creation awaits with eager expectation the revelation of the children of God. A few verses later in Romans 8, he continues, In hope we were saved. Now hope that sees for itself is not hope, for who hopes for what one sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait with endurance. And then finally in Philippians chapter 3, St. Paul writes, Our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So notice all these different ways in which this word wait is being used. Waiting with eager expectation. Waiting with hope. Waiting with endurance. This is the disposition that we're invited to have as Christians. Journeying on this uh, Christian life, we're called to have this disposition of this joy-filled, this hope-filled, desire-filled waiting. It reminded me, of this line that the priest says after we've all prayed the Our Father in the liturgy, he says these words, 
Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. So as Christians, we're called to live in this world with our eyes fixed on heaven. That's where we get our hope from, that hope for eternal life, that there's more to life than just what we're experiencing on this earth. We have our eyes fixed on the prize, so to speak, and that is the coming again of our Lord Jesus. It reminds me of uh, a frequent question that Bishop Bruce asks a lot of times in his homilies. Maybe you've heard it if you've watched the live stream, and if not, I'm preparing you for when he may come one day to All Saints, and he asks this in a homily. You'll be prepared. Because he often asks people in his homilies, how many of you woke up this morning thinking about heaven? And, you know, sometimes people chuckle or they kind of look around like, is this guy serious? And he goes, no, I'm, I am serious. He goes, if you didn't wake up thinking about heaven this morning, how do you presume to be able to get there? Like, if you don't have the destination in mind, how do you know that you're going in the right direction? If you don't have, if you don't have it on your radar, how are you going to just kind of magically wind up there? We have to have our eyes on the prize with this eager expectation, with hope directing our whole lives towards heaven. So again, the apostles and Mary, they're in the upper room, and they're, they're asked to wait to receive the Holy Spirit. That period of waiting wasn't just passively chilling, kicking their feet up, twiddling their thumbs, just kind of chilling out. No, they devoted themselves with one accord to prayer. So that leads me to another point here about our own prayer lives. Our whole life as Christians kind of has this desire-filled expectation, awaiting with endurance, awaiting with hope. Um, but even in our specific moments of prayer, when we kind of quiet ourselves down, take maybe 10, 15 minutes, or for those of you who pray a holy hour, just to be able to silence ourselves, put ourselves in the presence of God, um, we're encouraged to have this same disposition, this same disposition of an expectant hope that's looking, that's waiting, just like that dog with its treat on its nose. It's, it's attentive, right? Um, when we go to prayer, we're not just kind of passively waiting for God to just like come out of nowhere and smack us with like these graces and these mystical visions and all, all that sort of stuff. It's like he wants to work with us. Prayer involves kind of this teamwork. Like it involves God's grace, but he wants us to participate. He wants us to be active because prayer is about this relationship with God. And what kind of human relationship would it be if uh, one party was just constantly just kind of like kicking back and just waiting for the person to do all the work? It's like, no, God wants to engage with us. He wants this relationship with us. So a couple images came to my mind here. Um, if you think of a sailor, how does the boat move? Well, the sailor is totally dependent on the wind coming into the sails and carrying the boat. But the sailor still has to be attentive to where it is that the wind is coming from, what direction it's coming from, how quickly it's coming in, so that they can adjust the sails. And in adjusting the sails, then the wind can move it. Or if any of you uh, have played sports, uh, one of my favorite sports is racquetball. So if you've ever played that, or tennis, or really most other sports, you know that there's a certain kind of uh, position you can put yourself in, this kind of position of being ready to maybe return a serve with, when it's in racquetball. Um, you're, you're in this kind of ready position to go in any direction you might need to go at a moment's notice. Because if you're just flat-footed like this, just kind of passively waiting for things to happen, it's going to zoom by it, right? So if you're in this active position, like in racquetball, waiting to see which direction the ball is going, you're going to be more attentive. You're going to be in this period of waiting, but it's a waiting that's directed towards this attentiveness of where is it coming from. So I, I say all that to kind of illustrate the point that when we're in prayer, um, prayer kind of develops generally for most people by just silencing ourselves and entering into that place where we're able to hear that still, small voice of the Good Shepherd. Um, and it's totally a grace from the Lord. It's the Lord who takes us deeper into prayer. But He wants our teamwork. He wants us to adjust the sails. He wants us to be attentive and to go wherever it is that uh, He calls us. So again, another beautiful lesson we can take 
to prayer with us about the beauty of waiting and how that's an active waiting. So I want to get back now by concluding with Mary. She is the character of the resurrection we've been talking about tonight. We're going to tie this back in with her. Um, again, Mary is our great teacher. Just as we learned a lot from our own biological mothers, there's a lot we can learn in the life of our Christian faith by looking at our Blessed Mother. And she teaches us, particularly in this period of uh, ascension to Pentecost, how it is that we can abide in the waiting with hopeful expectations, how we can wait with great desires, with hope-filled desires. And we also see this on Easter Sunday as well, right? We see in her that every promise God made her was fulfilled. So we see this beautiful fulfillment in her being reunited with her son on Easter Sunday. We see the beautiful fulfillment of she's waiting for nine days uh, for the coming of the Spirit, and boom, the Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost. God fulfills his promises. And so we too, by looking at all the ways that God is faithful to Mary throughout her life, we can be strengthened in our faith and in our hope that what we are awaiting for will be fulfilled just as it was fulfilled in Mary. So I left you with a reflection question earlier in terms of just kind of observe, just be attentive to in this last month and a half or so where we've all been kind of in this period of waiting, uh, what would you say God has been doing in you in the time of waiting? God's not just at the finish line. He's here with you right now. What's he been doing in you? It's good to be noticing that. That's like one reflection question I want to leave you with. Here's the other thing I want to leave you with in case you're kind of like me and you're trying to find different creative ways to help pass the time in these days and you could use sort of like a, a homework assignment or, or some sort of like directive to help you in your prayer life. Um, I want to really encourage you from this talk and in the midst of this month of May where we commemorate Our Lady in a special way to consider what your relationship with Mary looks like and ask her for the grace to enter deeper into that relationship with her because she wants it for you um, and she wants to hear that you have this desire as well. And then find something concrete to help you in that relationship, to help you in that devotion. Um, for some of you, that might mean picking up the rosary. Maybe you'll find that that helps you in your prayer and devotion to Our Lady. Um, maybe for some others, it involves watching a new video or a movie that will help you connect to Mary in a new way, possibly. I want to leave you with one kind of practical suggestion of one way that can help you in your relationship with Mary. It was something that was actually very helpful for me because I, I haven't always felt very close to the Blessed Mother. I've, I've prayed the rosary over the years, but it's only been really, I think, in the last couple years that I've really been drawn into a deeper relationship with Mary. She hasn't been kind of this um, perfect person who's up there in the clouds, super distant from me. She is pure and she is holy and she is the queen of heaven. I'm, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but I'm really starting to see just in the last couple of years, just how close she comes to me, how she mothers me like any good mother out there would desire to do for her, her children. So the thing that helped me to kind of launch into that relationship was to consider that Mary, her heart, her motherhood, everything about her it's kind of like a multifaceted gem. Like, there's so many different aspects to Mary. Um, and you just think of all the different devotions there are out there to Mary. You think of all the different apparitions there have been over the years. You think of all the titles that uh, she's been referred to. There's all these different ways where Mary has revealed a different aspect of her motherhood, of her relationship to us, of her relationship to her son Jesus. And I think if we can see her in those different lights, if we see all those different ways in which she reveals the different aspects of her heart to her, I think we can kind of connect with certain ones more than others. So I want to invite you to be exposed to more titles or more apparitions of Mary and see uh, if, if that's something that Mary is using to call you into a deeper relationship with her. So what I want to do, just to kind of help you, if you have no idea where to start with this, I want to list off like close to 20 different titles of Mary. And maybe one of these is going to strike you. Like maybe you've said, oh, I, I've heard of that parish down the street. Or uh, I've heard of people mentioning that, um, but I've just never known about it. Or maybe something's going to strike you and say, whoa, I've never heard Mary under that title before. And hopefully this will encourage you to explore it, to do a little bit of research on where this title developed, what it is that uh, this title tells us about Mary and Jesus, and then maybe to find a new prayer 
that you can pray to Mary under this title. So let me just read to you a list of different uh, Marian apparitions or titles and see if any of these catches your attention that you want to kind of explore a little bit. So we have Our Lady of Guadalupe, well loved by many of our parishioners and I'm sure many people watching this. Mary, Mother of the Church. Our Lady, Star of the Sea. Mary, Star of the New Evangelization. Our Lady of Grace. Our Lady of the Miraculous Medal. Our Lady of Fatima, whose feast day is tomorrow. Our Lady of Lourdes. Mary of the Assumption, the patroness for our Diocese of Saginaw. Our Lady of Perpetual Help. Mother of Mercy. Our Lady of Sorrows. Queen of All Saints. This is All Saints Parish. Our Lady of Chestahova. Immaculate Heart of Mary. Mystical Rose. Spouse of the Holy Spirit. Undoer of Knots. So I want to leave you with, I want to conclude this by sharing you with you one of my favorite Marian titles and close us off with a prayer that's devoted to that title. So I just realized that Father Jose has an image of this in his chapel, so I'll show it to you right now. It's Our Lady Star of the Sea. Hopefully you can see that. And maybe you've heard of a parish that's called that. I know there's one in Jackson, Michigan. I think there's, there's several other ones, but I, I really love this title of Our Lady Star of the Sea. And I have a, a medal with Our Lady Star of the Sea on a necklace that I wear all the time. I keep close to my heart um, because that's a particular way that I felt connected with Mary more than all the other titles and apparitions. And just a little bit of context into this title. Um, the North Star, for any of you who have any uh, uh, history with or knowledge of um, astronomy, you know that the North Star r remains relatively fixed in the night sky. Um, and so this North Star has gone under a lot of different names over the years. Back in the time of the Romans, it was known as Polaris. Um, but around the time of the Middle Ages, the name developed Stella Maris in Latin, which is translated Star of the Sea. And this nickname for this North Star got translated to Mary, um, because Maris sounds a lot like Mary. Um, and so Mary kind of became known as Stella Maris, which is found in a lot of different Latin hymns um, and in a lot of different prayers in our Catholic tradition. The idea is that the North Star is a trustworthy guide for a sailor who's out on the seas um, when it's dark out. Because when the light's out, the sun is out, you can tell, okay, the sun is rising, that way is east, so we know we need to go this way. But at night, how do you get a sense of direction? How do you know which way you're going? Well, the North Star helps you to kind of stay oriented, to know what direction you're heading in. And so I think Mary can be like that for us in many ways. Because perhaps some of you watching right now, um, you're going through a time where you may be feeling as though it's nighttime, where you're feeling as though you're distant from God, perhaps. Perhaps there's a certain sense in which you're lost in life. You don't really know what the next step is going to look like. You don't know what the future is going to look like. Maybe you feel like this boat on the tumultuous sea, just kind of being rocked about by the waves. Well, I think this is an invitation for all of us to be praying to Mary under the title of Our Lady Star of the Sea. Because her motherly presence and her love for us, it's a constant in the midst of the many changes that we endure. She's a sure guide, and she's leading us to place all of our hope and all of our trust in her Son, the Lord Jesus. So I want to share with you this prayer that was actually written by Pope John Paul II that's addressed to Mary, uh, Star of the Sea. And I would invite you to find your own title, your own apparition of Mary that can help you grow in your relationship with her. So we'll close with this prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. O Mary, star of the sea, light of every ocean, guide seafarers across all dark and stormy seas, that they may reach the haven of peace and light prepared in him who calmed the sea. As we set forth upon the oceans of the world, and cross the deserts of our time. Show us, O Mary, the fruits of your womb, for without your Son we are lost. Pray that we will never fail on life's journey, that in heart and mind, in word and deed, in days of turmoil and in days of calm, 
we will always look to Christ and say, Who is this that even wind and sea obey him? Our Lady, Star of the Sea, pray for us. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks for joining for this installment of Characters of the Resurrection. Hopefully these were some fruitful reflections for you in this month of May to help you grow in your relationship and devotion to Mary. Be sure to join us next week as Father Jose takes the mic with another character of the resurrection. God bless. Have a great week.